Hello, everybody. I just want to make sure uh, if you can see my slate grade. I want you to say hello. I want you to tell me where you're from. If you're a student learning at home, whether you're homeschool or you're learning through a virtual platform with your teacher, let me know what you, who you represent and what school. Or if you're a homeschool, tell me who you're representing. I see Lydia has two little ones ready for some signs. Welcome, welcome. We have uh, Kimberly signing in. Mom and daughter remote learning in Edison. Welcome. Puerto Rico. All right. Welcome. New Providence, New Jersey. Third grade. Excellent. Homeschool from New Jersey. Kristen and Gianna. Welcome, welcome. We got another group of homeschoolers. Excellent. Interested in knowing how an eye works. Excellent. Well, you came to the right place. So for those of you just joining, um, as you hear, I'm giving out some shout outs today. So if you are learning at home or working at home with your, with your young scientists, let me know where you're all hailing from. If there's a school that you want to represent and give a shout out, go ahead. If you're a homeschool, definitely shout it out as well. Starting in about three minutes, but I see there's a couple of people from Pennsylvania. We got Adam, who goes to school 28. We got Dahlia and Emil. I apologize if I don't say your name correctly. We got Grayson and Quentin in South Jersey. Brittany, hey Brittany, how are you? Five-year-old Hunter watching in Jersey, welcome. Oh man, we got all the way down in Florida. We got Ridgewood, Middlesex County. Oh man, we have a lot of people coming in. All right, homeschoolers out of Union, Ezra and Esther. We got Yonkers, New York. Hey, Yonkers. So I just want to give a sh special shout out to James and Darlene because I know they had a question if we were going to do something about how I works yesterday's uh, in le yesterday's live stream. So I'm glad you came in just in time to check us out. All right, we'll be starting in about two minutes. So we got one more minute until we start, but I figure I'd introduce myself, give some more shout outs to people. Hey Caroline, I see we also have people from Brick, New Jersey, Long Island, North Brunswick. We got Somerset coming in. So hey everybody, my name is Alejandro. I'm a distance learning specialist at Liberty Science Center. As you can tell, I'm representing LSC very nicely on my shirt. Um, so just to give you a rundown, so obviously we are going to be doing a cow eye dissection. 
So today is part of an ongoing series that will be occurring every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Uh, if you tuned in for the past couple of times, I know you probably have seen me uh, do the kidney transplant overview a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you might have seen Ms. Caroline who did our uh, look into cardiac risk factors um, about last week around the same time. And if you stay tuned throughout the week as well, you might have seen Mr. Kango talk about maple seed models yesterday. You might have seen Mr. Andrew do a little bit of planetarium presentations. He's going to be doing one on exoplanets this Thursday at 1 p.m. We also have Mr. Fred and Mr. Depeche doing an awesome job uh, showing us uh, some animal updates that usually occur around 1 p.m. on Wednesdays. And Mr. Depeche will be the trivia master. So he does trivia uh, geared towards older scientists on Thursday nights around 7. And for family trivia on Fridays at about 11, 11.30. All right. So ours is part of an ongoing series called Live From Surgery. So a little bit about Live From. Um, it's actually part of a really awesome marquee program at Liberty Science Center uh, where we... Uh, have students come in to the Science Center or they can connect virtually uh, with their school and they get to see a procedure being done in real time and are able to ask questions to the surgeons. So I kind of gave you a quick uh, look at one of the surgeries, kidney transplant a couple weeks ago. Uh, Ms. Caroline gave you a nice preview of what we normally teach to our students uh, during the cardiac live rooms that we have. And one of the big things that we do in Live From is not only give students uh, a peek inside the OR and understand what the procedure is about, why the procedure is very beneficial, uh, we talk about a lot on anatomy. So as you can see, we're going to be talking about the anatomy of the eye. Uh, and we have a special guest, all right, uh, that I will be introducing to you all in a little bit. But I just want to give you a couple of shout-outs. I know people are coming in. If you are just tuning in, feel free to say hello. Um, I have my colleague, Ms. Rosa, uh, providing uh, support. You'll see her uh, commenting under Liberty Science Center. We also have another colleague of mine, Jeremy, who will be posting some other information on there as well. Um, and so if there are any questions... Feel free to drop those in the comment section. I will do my best to look over from time to time to answer some of those questions. I'll have Ms. Rosa providing you some qu uh, answers to those questions as well. But go ahead, uh, give me a hello. Tell me where you're hailing from, uh, where you're learning from home, where you're working from home. Uh, if you want to give a shout out to your school, uh, go ahead. Uh, Give a school a shout out. If you are a home school, feel free to give yourself a shout out as well. We want to make sure that everyone is included in our special shout outs. You'll probably see me uh, looking over the screen a little bit off towards my right. That's where I have the comment stream coming in. So I'll do my best to uh, see all those questions and give you some of those answers. All right. So obviously you're not here to look at me. All right, the entire 30 to 45 minutes that I have with you. So I'm going to introduce you to my specimen. All right, so here we go. This is our cow's eye. All right, so you'll be seeing me reaching over my document camera, sort of like zooming in so you can get a better look at this cow eye. All right, so we're going to be doing a lot of interesting things in terms of learning the structure and function that make up the eye. Now my question is to you, and go ahead, feel free to mention it in the comments. All right, drop your answers in there because I'm going to be asking a lot of questions. I may be doing a lot of the dissection, but I'm going to ask some of you some questions as the dissection goes along. So my very first question to you is why do we use a cow's eye to study a human eye. So as I give you some time to give me some answers, type those into the common stream. I'll turn it around so you can see the outside features. So 
So as that's going on, as you're typing in those answers, I'll give you some more shout outs. We got Rebecca tuning in from Washington, New Jersey. We got Tina shouting out to Cinnamon Sin High School. Uh, middle school, I should say. I, I'm so used to seeing Cinnamon Sin High School in our live from program. Uh, PS41 in Staten Island. All right, that's Polly. Welcome, welcome. Ah, I see some answers coming in. So because they are so big, excellent. So the main thing about why we use cow eyes, as you can see, so as I compare it to my hand, as I zoom out a little bit, all right, you can see that it's pretty big, all right? Another one I just saw coming in is that they are similar to the human eye, all right? So we got Renzo saying that. We got Darlene saying that. Excellent, excellent. Uh, that's absolutely right. So what we're going to be doing is, for all of you, uh, this is a nice introduction to what we call comparative anatomy. And so comparative anatomy, all it means is that we look at specimens throughout all species, including humans. And what we do is we look at anatomical features, whether it's our eyes, our entire body, certain parts of the body, and compare it to those similar body parts in other animals. Understand, it, do they have similar functions, what they may differ in terms of anatomy and structure, and take it from there so we can better understand our very own bodies as well. And I know some of you probably just started asking this question of how did we get this cow's eye? So for us, obviously, we don't go out to, you know, uh, the backyard in, at Liberty Science and we have a cow farm going there and we take, the, take those eyes out. That's inhumane and that's actually not how it happens. Uh, so obviously... Cows are a big producer for our needs. So we get dairy from them, uh, such as milk. We use it to make cheeses. Uh, we also use them for consumption in terms of meats. We also use their skin for leather. Um, and so there are a lot of parts that do not get used. And so when we talk about cow's eyes, those are some of the parts that normally get discarded. So... Uh, for any scientific institution or a school, it's a nice way to utilize so that way those parts do not get uh, needlessly thrown away and disposed of. That way we can use the entire animal itself and also use it for the advancement of science learning. All right, so hopefully that answered your question in terms of how do we get our cow's eye. Now, let's look at our cow's eye again. So here we have the entire eye, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the external anatomy first, all right? So we have the front portion here, obviously, but let's look at the back, all right? So in the back, we have some structures, so I'll point them out. The first structure is sort of like this yellowish color right here, all right? Can anyone take a lucky guess as to what this could be in terms of the eye external anatomy? All right, so we want to give a special shout out to Ms. Kira. She wants to thank the cows for donating the weird bits to science. Absolutely. Without that contribution, we obviously will have a lot more uh, difficulty in learning our anatomy. So close. Someone said the retina. Excellent guess. So the retina we won't be able to see until the inside. So to give you a little bit of a hint, this provides the cushion for the socket. So pretend that my hand is the socket, all right, of the skull, and it kind of just nestles in like that. So that provides the cushioning so that way the structure itself isn't hitting that bone. Any other guesses? Cartilage, all right. So someone said the optic nerve, excellent. So the optic nerve, just to jump ahead, is actually this little structure right here. So you see it right in the dead center that I'm using my probe to kind of wiggle it? That's actually the optic nerve. 
So the optic nerve, just to give you all a nice idea of what is significant about this structure, is that it's the nerve that carries that information from whatever enters the eye. So it travels from the eye through the organ itself, and it comes to this cord. So think of it as kind of like a cable that you hook up uh, your TV to your like uh, game console. All right, so it's sort of like that. It's a cable that connects the eye to the brain. So this little nerve, I should say it's a big nerve. There's about a, a, over a million little nerve fibers making up this one giant thick cord carries that information of what the eye sees all the way to the brain, so that way the brain can interpret it. All right, so someone mentioned cartilage, and that's a very excellent observation. So this is actually fat. So anything yellow is the fat, and so this provides the cushion for the eye when it rests within the socket. So if my hand was that socket, that fat, you can actually see it poking out through here, provides that extra cushion, that extra layer, in order for the eye not to interact so much with the socket, with that bone. All right, Juliana, hello, learning from home, seven years old, welcome, welcome. So, let's look at something else. So we, we already talked about the optic nerve, we talked about the fat, we also have this brownish color. So there's actually one, two, it's a little bit hard to see the others. There's another one right there, three, and there's somewhere, somewhere around here is a fourth one. What do we call these structures? Does anyone want, know what those structures are? So we have four of them right here. They're a little bit brownish in color. They're very different from the fat. So what are those structures? All right, so we got Jillian and Leonor. You're absolutely right. These are muscles. So very good question about the blood vessels. I know Jody mentioned blood vessels. We'll talk about that in a little bit, all right? But Kate also says muscles, excellent observation. I see everyone, I can't fool anyone today. Everyone's absolutely correct. We got muscles, all right? So muscles, in terms of our kawaii, there are about four of them, all right? So that means that we can have the kawaii move up and down and left and right. So I have my document camera positioned differently, so it may look different from you. So here we go. So we got up and down and left and right, all right? So, humans actually have six muscles, all right, behind our eye. So, not only can we have our eyes move left to right, up and down, um, we also have another pair of muscles that make up the six uh, that allows us to have the ability to roll our eyes. Um, and I know for a lot of parents out there, all right, and I'm sure your parents can attest to they've done it when they were younger. If you have your parent lecturing you and, you know, you don't want to hear it anymore, you kind of instinctively kind of start rolling your eyes and your parents catch you doing it. So that's one way that you can utilize those muscles. But all those muscles are very important. So that way you can have a nice visual field of what you're looking at. So not only are you looking directly, but you can actually shift your eyeballs all right, left to right in any direction you may want without the need of moving your head. All right, so let's look back at our external anatomy. All right, so we got our muscles, we got our fat, all right, we got our optic nerve. So let's look at the front. All right, so what we have the front is the front of the eye, obviously. So this is where all that process comes into play. This is the gateway, the portal, for those things that we are looking at to enter into the eye and send that information to the brain. All right? So let's look at this area right here. So it's sort of the, 
uh, pretty much the rim, okay? It does have like a darkened color to it, all right? But mostly we can look at this area right here, all right? So it is a little bit discolored because it is preserved, all right? So it has been stored under uh, pre preservation chemicals. But if you're looking at this with a second person or someone in the room with you, if you stare at each other right now, and you stare right into each other's eyes, and you notice that white part of the eye, that's what I'm showing you. So on our cow's eye, we call this the sclera. All right, so now the sclera is a tough, strong outer layer, and it protects the internal working parts of the eye. All right, so it kind of uh, protects everything else from the outside environment. Okay, so that's what we mean when we talk about the whites of our eyes. So that's the sclera. Okay, now there is another lining that kind of hugs the sclera. Okay, we call that the conjunctiva or the conjunctiva. There really is no specific way of saying it. It really depends on who you ask. All right, so it's actually a thin membrane. It's a thin clear protective layer so I'm actually lifting it up right now so I'm gonna zoom in for you all so you can look at it so I'm gonna take my probe and there it is you can actually there it is so I got through so this little area so you can kind of see where I'm holding it up so you, I'll turn it to the side so you can see so that thin clear membrane is what we call the conjunctiva or the conjunctiva. All right, so as I mentioned, it's a thin, clear, protective layer that goes over the surface of the eye, the lining of the eyelids, and it kind of envelops the out a very, very thin membrane over the opening. All right, so you may be familiar with a condition called conjunctivitis. All right, so whenever you talk about a type of condition, all right, anything that ends with I-T-I-S, that means it's a swelling of something. So when we're talking about conjunctivitis, we're talking about the swelling of the conjunctiva. You may be familiar with it in terms of the normal term of it, of pink eye. All right, so pink eye is the... swelling of the conjunctiva and so what occurs here is that the conjunctiva is very vascular so what we mean by that is that there are small blood vessels uh, within this lining and so whenever you have uh, an infection or a type of allergic reaction so for some people who tend to have seasonal allergies or allergy to dust their eyes turn a little bit red that's all the immune cells, all right, that travel through these blood uh, blood vessels, and they actually collect in one area to deal with whatever doesn't belong in that area, all right. So that's the conjunctivitis portion of it. So whenever your eyes turn red, uh, that's an immune response of trying to get rid of whatever is in that area that doesn't belong there. So it gets really red. You notice that your eyes get a little bit watery. So that's a reaction as well of getting rid of that by washing it out of the eye. All right. Let's get back to our eye anatomy here. So I mentioned this opening, this portal, correct? And what we have is this portion right here. So I'm going to squeeze my eyeball to give it a little bit more shape. It's a little bit hazy now, but it's very clear when the eye is attached to the organism all right so this is what we call the cornea the cornea is a clear area of the sclera so remember the sclera is on the side so as we go over here the cornea is that clear area that bends the light onto the retina so when we look at the cornea all right it's that entryway all right it's a clear area all right, that you'll see if you look at each other's eyes and you look directly right into the center of the eye, all right, you're not going to see the cornea. All right, the cornea is very clear, 
What you see are some other anatomical structures that we'll be talking about in a little bit, all right? But the cornea is providing that window for that light, whether it's coming from the monitor that you're looking at, from the light in the room, it's going to enter into that gateway, into that portal, all right? And our cornea is very cool in the fact that it is, has many layers to it. So if I were to scratch against the cornea, you can see there's like little bits and pieces coming off, all right? There are many layers to the cornea. So in our cow's eye, we have seven layers for the cow's eye. Humans have five layers, all right? The cornea, among those layers, provide that nourishment, that lubrication for the uh, anatomical structures within that area, and we'll look at those in a little bit, but also provides protection. So, for our cow eye, if you're thinking about cows, why do you think cows, or any animal, for example, goats, pigs, why do you think they would have more layers to their cornea than a human would? So let's check it out. So let's see some of those answers, some of those thoughts. It looks like his pupil has plastic wrap on it. Weird. Excellent observation, Maria. Uh, we'll actually look at the pupil in a little bit. That's actually what's behind the cornea. Let's see, probably. Uh, so why do you think we have more layers on the cornea than uh, on the cow's eye than we have on a human eye? So humans actually have five layers. Cows, for example, have seven. Now, why do you think that? Ah, excellent observation from Kathleen because they need more protection. Absolutely. I see someone has a, has a nice little punchline there because their cornea is corny. All right. I enjoy a good dad joke from, me, from time to time. Uh, my colleagues can attest to that. They get very tired of it, but it's okay. I'm ha I get entertainment out of it, so I do it anyway. So you're absolutely right. So we have protection for the cornea. All right. So cows... Goats, lambs, they dig their heads into grass in order to eat. And so grass is very sharp, all right? So you need that extra protective layering to ensure that it doesn't damage the eye. Now, when we talk about the corneas within humans, all right, that also provides protection. You may hear, uh, especially with the adults that are looking, uh, looking at this live stream, you may hear your eye doctor say, oh, you know, it may be a corneal abrasion or corneal scratch. Your cornea has the ability to heal itself over time if it's just on the surface type scratches. Something that are, that are cuts that are, tend to be deeper than one layer, Obviously requires a little bit more attention with the eye doctor and some treatment, but your cornea has the ability to heal itself over time if you have some micro abrasions to it. All right. Now, I know everyone's excited. They want to open up the eye, so let's do it. So I'm going to poke through before I open up the eye. All right. So I'm going to poke through with my probe here to make an opening, and I'm going to tip it over. And I'm going to squeeze. And you should see something coming out. So as soon as you see it, let me know. Now, what do you think that could be? So we have all of this. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a lot of reactions to it. I see a lot of yeses, a lot of sick face emojis. I see a puke face emoji. All right, excellent. So everyone can see it. So this is what we call the aqueous humor. So this fluid, so you can see it's very clear. This fluid fills the front of the eye and helps bend light into, into the retina, or I should say onto the retina. All right, so... Obviously, so there's not much aqueous humor left. So you kind of see it's a little bit more deflated now. So if I were to squeeze it, you can see it's giving you that nice shape to it. 
All right, so as we get ready, because obviously we're done with the external anatomy, let's go into the nitty gritty. Let's look inside. All right, so let's get my dissection scissors on the ready. So at this time, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. I'll try my best to get them answered as I cut open. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut along the sclera. All right, so the sclera, as I mentioned before, is pretty thick. So I'm going to make a cut right here. So one of the big things that you learn when you do dissections is to learn how to handle your surgical instruments, your dissection instruments, very carefully. Because obviously you're going to be dealing with a lot of structures that are very tough to cut open. And you don't want, as you're making a cut, you don't want to end up hurting yourself. So as I provided a lot of pressure to it, I tried my best to avoid sending that surgical instrument through or dissection instrument through to cut my hand. All right, so you can see I'm slowly opening it up. So I'm going to keep going. So let's... Oh, I see someone mentioned vitreous humor. Excellent observation. All right, hold that thought for later on. We'll actually see some vitreous humor in a little bit. So have no fear. We have Miss Rosa helping out with answering questions. So definitely take some time doing so. So let's open this up. So you notice we have some many different layers, all right? So you can see why it's so difficult to make that opening. So here we go. So I'm going to take it off the screen because I'm kind of manipulating there. So let's see. Let's see, what other questions do we have? edible so is it edible um, I personally don't eat cow's eyes uh, the cow's eyes really don't provide much nutritional value so people don't tend to eat it it's not part of the dish as far as I know all right so here's what's going to happen so what we notice is that this eye is actually more uh, more meat than more fat and more muscle than I so I'm gonna try and do my best to cut it open so I'm gonna take out my scalpel and we're gonna cut it right in there alright so I'm gonna make an incision right there so actually I actually passed the entire structure of the internal anatomy so we're going to do our best to get the scalpel through. And if not, that's okay. If we can't get through this eye, luckily for us, we have other eyes. So you kind of saw a big squirt happen. All right. So hopefully I have some of it still preserved in there. So that big gush of liquid was vitreous humor. So the vitreous humor provides that shape of the internal eye. It's jelly-like fluid, and it's very clear. So it allows that light to pass through. So that can get back to the retina all right so here we have the internal anatomy so we're gonna step away from the other inner parts of the eye all right what we're gonna do is I'm gonna place this portion right here and I'm gonna zoom in all right so there are a couple of structures there is some vitreous humor in there okay but I'm gonna dig out this structure right here so I'll save that for later. You probably may have a guess as to what it is already. But let's look at this black lining. Alright? This black lining, we all have. 
All right. Except for us. Oh, what's all that green stuff? All right, that's from Cagney. So Cagney, keep it, keep it tight. Hold on tight. We'll talk about that on uh, as we get to that part of the anatomy. But good observations. I love him. Everyone's observations. All right, everyone's noticing all these different structures. You're all asking the perfect questions here. All right, so let's look at this area right here. So for us, they may come in different colors. So some of you may have blue, some of you may have brown, some of you may have hazel, black, all right? This is what we call the iris, all right? The iris is that colored sheet of muscle that controls the amount of light that enters the eye, okay? So if I were to pull this iris out, and I know a lot of people are already mentioning it, uh, the pupil itself is actually the opening of the iris. So let me try and pull it out here. So there we go. So let me put that aside. So there's the iris. All right, so that is that muscle there. And within the iris is our pupil. All right, so let me make a small little incision here. So we can see that nice and round. So you can see there is the pupil. So that's the opening right there. Okay, so the pupil is that hole, all right, that allows light to enter through the eye. So the iris, the pupil, work in tandem, work together to allow how much light can enter your eye. So this is essential in order for you to focus and have a good view of your visual field. Um, it's also a very nice adaptation in which... Um, if you were to enter a dark room, your pupils will actually what we call dilate. They'll actually go from very small and they will actually widen open to allow more light to go in and get that visualization in. If you have too much light in the room, your pupils will then constrict and actually become very small to limit the amount of light going into your eye. So. I myself, whenever I go to an eye doctor checkup, especially since I have something called astigmatism, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, I have to go to the eye doctor for my yearly checkup, and they put eye drops into my eye. And after a while, it's very hard to look at things because there's so much light, and it's very hard to look. And that chemical, that eye drop, allows those pupils to dilate so that way they can get a nice view of your internal eye anatomy. So that's uh, so the iris and the pupil work together to make it constrict. Now let's look at our next image here, our next structure. This is the lens. And as you may all know, the lens is that clear disc that focuses the light onto the retina. That what is what provides the fine focus. Our lens is usually connected to other ligaments that help shape the lens to make that fine adjustment to make sure that enough light is focused onto the retina. Okay? So, as we're looking on the lens, the really cool thing about the lens is it has many different layers. So let me see if I can pull some off with my fingers. So you can see right there, there are many different layers to a lens, sort of like an onion. When you peel the onion back, there are many different layers. So as you grow older, your lens will add a nice little layer that on the previous one. So as you get older, there's another la layer, another layer, another layer, another layer. All right, so that gives that lens that definition and shape. As that lens becomes thicker, um, it also kind of coincides when people, as they get older, they may have some difficulty uh, with blurry vision, all right? Um, we call that age-related blurriness, all right, presbyopia. And that's a natural occurrence that happens with uh, all individuals. So uh, you may notice that uh, people who are nearsighted or myopic, uh, that means, you know, they can only see things very up close. All right, they may need to use uh, a different set of lenses, especially for those who are farsighted as well. 
or even, you know, people with normal 2020 vision, all right? They would probably need like reading glasses or some type of very uh, weak prescription to give that finer focus, all right? So that happens naturally. So now that we have the lens, let's look at the back portion, all right? So you can see there is a jelly-like substance in there. Someone mentioned it. It was the vitreous humor. All right, so as I mentioned, it's a clear liquid that allows that light. So you can actually see how that nice little sheen from my document camera kind of reflects off there. So that allows that light. So obviously in a much more enclosed eyeball, that liquid will actually direct that light towards the retina. So let me just dump out this vitreous humor. So I actually have to scoop it out very, very carefully because I don't want to damage the back structures so you can see there is some jelly there all right so it's kind of like a gel like substance that's our vitreous humor you notice it's a mixture of like jelly like substance with liquid all right uh for a lot of individuals uh if you uh especially of all ages if you notice little things kind of floating in your field of vision and every time you look at it, it kind of shifts we call those floaters uh, so these floaters um, are like little bits of collagen. So these are little bits of protein that are found within the vitreous humor. Uh, so as you get older, um, that gel-like substance kind of liquefies a little bit, and that's where the little floaters come in. These little bits of collagen, these protein uh, uh, molecules will actually clump up together, and those little floaters is what you see in your field of vision when you kind of shift it around you kind of see it kind of in your field of vision you don't know what it is it's too blurry those are what we mean by floaters now floaters are normal the amount of floaters that you see as your vision progresses as you get older are usually indicative of some other conditions okay so if you have uh, any questions about that my colleague Ms. Rosa or myself will be more than happy to go more in depth but I want to make sure that we get through all the anatomy before we get to more questions all right so i know that cagney and a, a lot of other young scientists mentioned what is that green stuff in the back so that green stuff is actually a structure that's behind the retina so you notice the retina is very thin the retina is the big one of the more essential parts of our eye because the retina is where our photosensitive cells are located all right what i mean by pho photosensitive cells are these are the cells that are responsible for collecting that light information and sending it through the optic nerve we have two types of photosensitive cells we have rods and we have cones one singular eyeball in the human eye has about 130 million photosensitive cells 90 percent of them are rods the rest the 10 percent are cones so when we talk about rods and cones, we'll do with cones because it's much simpler to define. Cones deal with color, all right? So they provide that information of different types of color that you see in your environment. So if you notice on my background, my background is blue. And so your eye is picking up that blue light, all right? That information through your eye so it gets picked up by the cones, sent it to the optic nerve, to the brain, and it's registering that blue background. Our rods kind of have a bigger, bigger uh, load in terms of information processing. Our rods are usually good for low light types of field vision. So if you're out uh, in a room that's very dimly lit, or you know, once your eyes become accustomed to the dark room, you can sort of make out shapes, but you don't see much color to it. Uh, your rods also provide that peripheral vision. So right now you're probably staring at the screen, so your central focus right now is the screen. And, but you can still make out on what's all around that screen. So right now for me, I have my laptop in front of me with my webcam as my direct field of vision. But I have my second, my second monitor here with all the comments and questions. I have my dot cam. I can see my uh, dissection tray. So that's peripheral vision. Okay. So let's get back to that retina. So if I pull it back, it's extremely, extremely thin. 
All right, so I'm going to try my best to pull it out, so not to pull out that green stuff. Okay, so we have a portion here where the retina kind of attaches to a part of the back of the eye here. All right, we call that the entrance of the optic nerve, normally called the, the blind spot. So as I mentioned, that's the point in which the retina kind of conjoins with, with the optic nerve to start sending that information back to the brain. So you can actually see a nice little view right there. There's the blind spot. So you probably are asking, you know, how come we don't see that blind spot? Because there's no rods, no cones in there. There's no photosensitive cells in there. So it's like actually a, a black little spot. You may question why we don't see that blind spot. That's where your brain comes in. Your brain has the power to process everything within the eye, collect all that information, and fill in all those little blanks. So that's why we don't see that blind spot very well. Now, we got the next structure here. We got two more structures to talk about, and then I'll do some more questions. All right, we have this bright lining right here. It's called the tapetum lucidum. Tapetum lucidum is Latin for bright tapestry. So as you can see, as I have that light coming out from my document camera, you can see that nice little sheen going on in that tapetum. All right, tapestry means it's just the lining in the back. It just stretches from one side of the eye to the other. Okay, so this right here, so let's get a closer look at it. So let me zoom in and get myself out of view. So this tapetum lucidum, is very specific to animals, all right? Humans do not have this, all right? So the tapetum lucidum itself is an extra lining uh, that is located behind the retina. So you saw like how I had to pull the retina apart so you can get a better view of it. Uh, this is to provide really good night vision, okay? Uh, so what the tapetum lucidum will do is your eye will gain that light information. It'll go through. Actually, I have a nice little uh, internal anatomy portion here. Okay, so we're already talking about all the different types of internal anatomy and some definitions, all right? Um, but here we just have the term. So the tapetum lucidum is that lining behind our retina. As your light information goes to the retina, all those rods and cones will translate it, send it to the brain. However, when that happens, there is a lot of light that might get uh, unabsorbed. It will just miss the retina, uh, or it just doesn't hit the retina just right, and doesn't get picked up, get that information processed, and that bit of information is lost. Which is okay, because your brain is still making up the big picture. So we don't notice that loss of information. For nocturnal animals, so those are animals that can see at night and that are pretty active at night, uh, this tapetum lucidum is very important because what the tapetum lucidum will do is that it'll reflect that light that gets lost, that doesn't get picked up by those photosensitive cells, gets bounced off by the tapetum lucidum and it'll activate those cells again so that way they can get a nice view of the nighttime. Uh, if you have pets at home, you may notice this, especially if you love taking photos of your pets. So here are two examples right here. These are my two puggles. The one on the left is Samson. And the one on the right, the one that's kind of creeping out in the dark there, uh, that's his little brother, Trooper. All right, so as you can see, uh, give credit shout out to my sister who took these photos. Uh, so you can see we have the flash on for our photos. And you can see that bright light uh, that comes out uh, in the picture if you use that flash on your pets or especially if you're a wildlife photographer you get those a lot from animals that's the tapetum lucidum working so there is a bright flash of light from our camera and all that excess light that did not get picked up by the uh, retina at the first time will get bounced back by the tapetum lucidum so you can see them as yellow green reds 
All right, and that's where the tapetum lucidum comes into play. Now, let's look at our final structure, and we'll take some questions because I've been talking too much. Hopefully, you didn't get too bored with it. But let's look at the back portion. So let me take the tapetum lucidum off. So this is the actual back portion of the eye. So this is how our eye looks at looks like when we get rid of all the internal structures and the retina. Okay, so we call this the choroid, C-H-O-R-O-I-D. It's a dark pigmented layer that absorbs the light, but it that's all it does. It keeps that light from being reflected. All it does is absorb it and does not reflect that. So you notice that just like our tapetum lucidum, so I'll bring it out again. So you see, as I have my document camera onto the tapetum lucidum, you see some of that reflection, some of that nice sheen. But if you look at the choroid, you don't see much of that reflection going on. Most of that reflection is from that liquid, from that vitreous humor that just kind of, ch uh, kind of channeled in this area. But for the most part, a lot of that is not reflecting back. All right? So we went through our external anatomy. So we had this, the iris, the sclera, the pupil, the conjunctiva. All right, we also had some of that internal anatomy. All right, so we had the optic nerve, the aqueous and vitreous humor, the tapetum, uh, the retina. All right, so we just went through an entire journey of the eye. So, to keep myself from talking too much and just lecturing you, I'm going to take some time now to start answering those questions. So, if I didn't see them in the, in the stream originally, just retype them, have them out. If Ms. Rosa and Mr. Jeremy already answered some of those questions, uh, that's great. I'm glad that they were on top of it. All right, but I will definitely take some of those questions now. All right. So let's see. Uh, ah, the choroid looks like coral. Yeah. You can see it's uh, kind of has that design of coral looking going on there it's got all those all those uh, dark colors so the darker the color the more absorption of that light excellent excellent question excellent observation today how many muscles does the cow have excellent question so the cow in particular when we're talking about the eye anatomy of the cow so let me put on an Brand new gloves so you can check out the back. All right. So we have four. Four muscles. One, two, three, and the fourth one's right around here. Humans have six. So if this were to be a human eye, you would have one, two, three, and four, and then two more on the diagonal. All right. Why does the eye look like clay? Good question. So the eye looks like clay because obviously uh, it's not on a living creature. Uh, the li if it's on a living creature, you'll have actually a little bit more of a, uh, no pun intended, it kind of pops out um, in which uh, you can see a little bit more color, a little bit more defining features. Because of the preservation process, these cow eyes are kept in a preservative chemical to ensure that it doesn't decompose. So that way we can preserve all the anatomical structures as a whole so we can look at the defining features. So one of the downsides of the preservative chemical, um, also dealing with uh, cells that are not getting that nourishment, you get that discoloration. So you don't see the fat popping out as a more brighter yellow. You don't see the muscles either a darker red or a brighter red. Um, you don't see the sclera as a bright white. All because, you know, they don't, they're do not they not getting the nourishment and because of the preservative chemicals. Um, are all animal eyes the same from Marina? All right, excellent question. So that's the beauty of comparative anatomy. So... Comparative anatomy, as I mentioned all the way in the beginning, if you tuned in, uh, that's all about comparing all those structures, see if they have the same function. Uh, for a lot of animals, the functions and anatomical structures are pretty much the same. So as I went through all the internal eye anatomy, that usually applies 
for all animals throughout. There are certain differences, all right? For example, a really great example is an owl. The owl do not have muscles for them to move their eyes. Instead, if you've seen videos of owls, they turn their head at greater articulation than a human or other animals do. And so that allows it to see a nice view of their visual field. Um, their eyes are rather stuck into their sockets. Uh, for cats, uh, for sharks uh, that rely on very fine, ultra-focused vision, their pupils and their irises will work slightly different to allow more of that light in so they can look further distances. All right. So, Kate has a question. Do cow eyes have colors like human eyes? Why or why not? Excellent question. So, all cow eyes tend to be brown. Like a uh, brown, a uh, very dark brown. Uh, it's different among humans uh, because of the fact of our DNA. So, DNA has a genetic code, an ID, that determines that expression of characteristics. Uh, so, you know, depending on who, uh, you know, joins up with who and have children, that will determine eye color. Because of the fact that we are very diverse, even though we're one species, we are very diverse in terms of the smaller features, whether it's skin color, eye color, uh, whether we have curly hair or straight hair, that gives us characteristics. And because we interact with so many different people globally and... Uh, you know, people of different backgrounds get together and have children. All those different bits of information kind of come together and give you that specific uh, characteristic. So if we date back to all of our ancestors, we notice that we had those blues, those uh, greens, those browns. It all determines uh, by DNA. Very good question. So we have about a couple of minutes left. I went through everything and talked a lot, so let me try and get all those questions uh, answered. Oh, why do eagles have such good eyesight? So very good question. So that all pertains in terms of the lens, the iris, the pupil, the way that they all interact with one another, um, because you're also dealing with a bird that flies in very high altitude and so they need to have a laser eye focus at food or their prey uh, whether it's on the ground or within water and so in order for them to keep that surprise attack uh, before the prey notices that they're there um, they will use their adaptation of fine ultra focus laser sight along with other adaptations like their feathers and their wingspan and flight uh, to be a really good predator, a really good hunter, to get those, uh, to get those prey. And so you need that long distance, that ability to tel telescope in and see where those prey are, so you can plan your attack and get that food. What is the white stuff on the outside of the eye? So the white stuff on the outside of the eye is part of the sclera and kind of comes into play with your fat. All right, so we have an overlap of fat, and then it kind of transforms into that sclera. So that's the whites of our eyes that I was mentioning. All right, other questions. Are all the muscles connected? Very good question. So the muscles aren't necessarily connected, uh, because if you do have them all connected, then you kind of limit the articulation of the eye. So they aren't necessarily connected in the way that they're a one big unit. Uh, they're connected in the way of coordinating those movements to allow the eye to articulate and get a good big picture of your field of view. Ah, Jillian, who is nine, have you ever done this on a fish eye? Uh, so on a regular sized fish, uh, I personally haven't done it. I'm sure a lot of biologists out there have done it. Uh, we don't normally do it as a dissection program because the eyes tend to be very small. So cow's eyes, uh, sheep eyes, they tend to be very big and uh, are able to look at all those structures. Ah, if you, excellent question from Tina. If humans do not have a tapetum lucidum, do they have something else in that place? Good question. So, 
what we see here in terms of that lack of torpedo lucidum, all you'll see, if I can get some of that uh, retina back, so unfortunately the retina kind of like shrunk in size, but the retina will be there and then the choroid. That's it. Nothing else in between, uh, nothing else to reflect that light back. Uh, you're probably uh, mentioning in terms of red eye, so back uh, when we were younger, when your parents were younger, when we used actual cameras, uh, when the flash would happen, you normally would get like that little bit of a red flash eye. That's not necessarily a reflection of, you know, what's going on uh, in the back of the retina. That's actually the internal view of your eye because there's such a bright flash, such an excessive amount of light. Uh, you can actually catch some of that illuminating the inside of the eye. All right. So good question. Oh, and really quick. As, a, as to wrap up, I want to do a, a special uh, shout out to make sure that you check out LSE in the house. I know a lot of you were taking photos yesterday of the experiment that you did with Mr. Kengo, which is awesome. I love seeing all of those as well as all of my team members here. Mr. Kengo loved all of those. If you were taking photos or if uh, you're mentioning it through social media, don't forget to mention us on social media with the hashtag Liberty Science Center in one word or ha you know mention us uh, with our social media handles. Uh, check out more programs as I mentioned in the beginning uh, that we have all these programs lined up. We have our animal updates on Wednesdays. We have our adult trivia on Thursday nights, family trivia Friday mornings. Thursday afternoons, we have our planetarium shows, virtual field trips on Monday. We are jam-packed with so much stuff, and we want to see you get involved. So we definitely want to see some pictures of you interacting with us during our live stream or some of the demonstrations of our experiments uh, that we have posted. And also, a very important thing, I, I don't know if anyone asked questions on how to keep our eyes healthy, all right? Eating your fruits and vegetables, keeping a healthy diet, exercising daily, all right, you may not realize that exercising daily, a lack of exercise, um, and a poor you know, lifestyle in terms of food can actually have some uh, pr you know, primary uh, conditions, primary uh, risks that can also have a secondary effect to your eyes, okay? So your eyes can get effective, uh, affected in the long run. Um, also, follow what we call the 20-20-20 rule, all right? For every 20 minutes, especially now that you're looking at my live stream, all right? If you're looking at a screen for a very long time, that is not good for your eyes. Your eyes are just like any other organs and your muscles in the body. They will get tired after a while. So a good rule is 20-20-20. For every 20 minutes of staring at the screen, you're going to look at something in the room or something that's 20 feet away, stare at that for 20 seconds, and then you can go back to your screen. So that way you can give your eyes a rest. So if anything out of all of this, remember 20, 20, 20. Every 20 minutes, stare at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Now I'll take a couple more questions and then we'll end it. Ah, uh, St. Francis Academy in Union City. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Excellent, Maria, you are definitely now a Kawai expert. So everyone that checked this out, definitely have a step up if you ever do a Kawai in school. All right. Yes, carrots. Carrots is also a very good uh, indicator of good vegetables. Leafy greens, like your kales, uh, uh, your collard greens, very good sources for eye health. In terms of meats, you have your seafood, so your fish, uh, like tuna or salmon are usually really good uh, sources for eye health. All right, so hopefully you all enjoyed it. I know a lot of you stuck through it all, hearing me talk nonstop, so thank you for paying attention. Uh, remember, check us out at LSE in the house. Uh, for uh, for more information, lsc.org. Check out our Facebook, our Instagrams. We'll throw out more information out there of our next live streams and our next topics. And I hope to see you in another Live From series on Tuesdays at 1. Have a good day, everybody.